Hey, I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be taking a look at the updated bow and arrow project I've put together. Not only is it updated to work with new versions of XR Toolkit, but I've also made some quality of life changes and features that I missed out on in the previous iteration. If you'd like to follow along, you'll find most of the project code in the GitHub link below. We'll be writing a bit of code in the video to sort of pull everything together, but don't worry too much, I'll explain the project in its entirety the best I can before we get into that. For the specifics, I'm using Unity 2019.4.17 and XR Toolkit 1.0 pre-version 0.2. Yeah, that's a mouthful, but if you're using the project from GitHub, you shouldn't have to worry about this. And we specifically want to be at least using this version of XR Toolkit because we want to be utilizing the new event arguments which will also most likely be used once XR Toolkit hits its 1.0 release. Now, I think that about does it for all the messy stuff, but before we get into it, if you'd like to support me and see more videos and projects like this, feel free to check out my Patreon where I offer complete source code, updated, and exclusive projects. All right, now onto the project. One of the reasons I wanted to get this updated was because of Unity's prototype video that came out back in November of 2020. Believe it or not, that video used the previous iteration of this bow and arrow project which was really cool. So that kind of pushed me to come back to this project sooner rather than later to get it updated. And outside of the already requested changes, the video gave me some inspiration for changes I needed to make. I wanted to revisit the quiver code to make it behave better when being used over the shoulder. I wanted to create some simple targets that move when they were hit by arrows. I also wanted the arrows to stick with an objects once they were hit. I kind of neglected to do this in the previous iteration because if objects weren't uniformly scaled, this can create some like wonky things, so that's why I avoided it. And to facilitate both of those things, I wanted to create a simple system for objects to handle arrow impacts. I also included some other improvements where you can now reuse arrows that you fired. I removed the need for an animator or animation for pulling the bow back so it's much easier to switch out different meshes. And overall simplified a lot of the code within the project, primarily when it comes to dealing with releasing the arrow. And I think that about does it for everything, let's actually jump into Unity and take a look at the project. And once we get it opened up, it'll look something like this. And as always, the first thing that we're going to be taking a look at is our hierarchy here on the left. Obviously, the main thing is going to be this bow here, and everything else in the scene is pretty simple. We don't have any custom functionality on our XR rig, and for our scene, we just have our targets. Where the only thing we really need to know about is this target script down here on the bottom object where whenever it's hit by an arrow, we're just going to be applying a force to it and changing its material to let us know that we hit it. Everything else is pretty much on the bow, so let's look at that. Where, obviously when we select the bow, believe it or not, it's going to have a bow script on it. Where this is actually a really simple script that's just going to let our notch know when the arrow is picked up. And this prevents the sort of bow from picking up arrows on its own essentially. If you are holding the bow and you put an arrow into the socket and you drop the bow, it'll also drop the arrow from the socket as well. And that particular socket is going to be the notch here, where this is going to be the socket interactor that's going to be checking for any arrows in our scene. So as we're holding the bow and we're holding an arrow, if we get the arrow close enough to the notch, the notch is automatically going to grab it from the player's hand. And obviously we can't have a bow if we can't pull back on it, and that's what this pull measure is going to be handling for us. If you've seen any of my previous iterations of this project, both of these are going to look pretty familiar. I did make some updates for the pull measure to work with the line render that we're going to be using for the string instead of the animation, but other than that, they've primarily remained the same. And finally, let's look at the string, where like I said before, instead of having an animation, it's much easier if you want to switch out the artwork for the bow itself if we're not using a complex animation. So that's why we're just using a line renderer where it's going to be managed by the string renderer, where this is automatically going to be updated both at runtime obviously and within the scene, where once we start pulling on the pull measure, the string is going to change a different color based on this gradient. We're going to be getting any necessary values from the pull measure, and then we'll actually be manipulating the line renderer using these transforms here. These are particularly important, but or the middle one is particularly important, because that's the one that we're, our arrow is going to be following once we pull back on it. If we go back to our notch here, You'll see that the attached transform here is set to that middle transform. Um, and we'll be covering this in more detail once we look at the scripts and we write out the notch script, because this is the actual script we're going to be sort of doing in this video. Everything else I'm just going to have already written out for you. But the notch is particularly important because it not only interacts with the bow itself, but the pull measure and is also interacting with the arrow. 
And speaking of the arrow, we actually haven't looked at that yet. So let's go to our prefabs folder and we'll double click our arrow. Where the only thing that we really need to take note of is the arrow script here. We also have it on this ignore raycast layer. And this is because instead of just using a collider to detect collision, we're going to be using a line cast like I did in the previous project. And having it on this ignore raycast layer, we don't want the line cast that the arrow is shooting out in front of the arrow to accidentally detect itself. And we can check that here in this layer mask where we don't have the ignore raycast layer selected here. And we'll be looking at that more once we get into the script. So let's go back to our scene view. And I think that's it for the general project rundown. If we go to our scripts folder, and you don't have to do this right now unless you want to follow along, but I'm pretty much going to open up all these scripts. So let's jump into Visual Studio. Well, the first thing that we're going to be looking at is our quiver. It's the simplest of all the objects, and it inherits from the XR base interactable. And all we're doing here is once the quiver has been selected, we're going to create an arrow, and we're going to be using our interaction manager to force a selection on that interactor. And you can see that here. You'll also notice that we're getting this select enter event arguments. And this is that new thing that I was briefly mentioning at the beginning of the video, that instead of just having a argument that is a interactor or an interactable, we have these arguments so we can actually get additional information for what's going on. And we're using those arguments to get the interactor that's currently interacting with the quiver. So we can then create a new arrow, we'll be accessing the interaction manager, and we'll be forcing a selection to that interactor with the arrow. So once the hand grabs on the quiver, we create the arrow and the interaction manager gives it to the hand essentially. And that's pretty much it for the quiver. So let's move on to the bow. Where the bow is also a pretty simple script, it just inherits from the XR grab interactable. And kind of like I said before, all the bow is really doing is marking the notch as ready once the bow has been picked up or once it's been dropped. And this prevents an arrow from just automatically socketing itself in the bow or once the bow has been dropped, having an arrow still sit within the socket. But that's it for the bow, let's look at the pull measure. Where the pull measure is going to be inheriting from the XR base interactable, because all we really needed to do is detect once the player is essentially trying to interact with the string. And then once that starts to happen, we want to track that interactor and figure out what direction it's pulling in and see if it's an actual valid direction for the string itself. And when that's happening, we're going to be using this custom pull event here to let other things on our bow know when the string's actually being pulled back on. So we're going to be giving it an actual float value of 0 to 1 to describe how strong the pull is, but also the actual position that we want the string to be between our start and our end point. And I specifically needed to add this position because this is the position that's actually going to be used for that middle transform that I showed you previously for where the arrow is going to be sitting as well as where we need the string renderer to render that middle point to. But if we scroll down, this is kind of where all the magic is happening. Within our process interactable, if our pull measure is selected, we want to actually check for the pull. Where we're then using the position of the interactor that's pulling on the pull measure to actually figure out what's the strength of the pull that's actually happening. Where all that's happening down in this calculate pull function that I explained in sort of my previous video, which if you want to learn a little bit more about this more in detail, I'll link to that video as well. But what ultimately all that functionality gives us is a simple 0 to 1 value between our start and our endpoint, where we're then going to be using that value within this calculate position function, where we use our start and our end position again, and we just plug in that 0 to 1 value, where again, it's going to give us the position that we're going to be setting that middle transform at for both the attach point of our notch as well as our string renderer. And when that's occurring, those things are going to be notified by the event here, where anytime we're going to have a new pull value, we're going to be setting it and we're going to be calling that event and giving it those particular values. All right, and I think that about does it for the sort of essentials of this script. Let's actually look at the string renderer to see how we're using some of these values. Where our string renderer is pretty simple, we kind of already went over the sort of gist of it. But you'll see here in an on enable, we're subscribing to this on before render event. And this is because this is going to give us the smoothest result for when we're actually moving the string. Because if you've used a line renderer, you can't just set it and forget it. We constantly have to be updating it. And this ensures that it's rendered before we're actually moving any of our VR stuff. Where right before our camera and everything gets updated, we're going to be setting the positions of our line renderer using the our start, middle, and end position. So this pretty much happens every single frame. You'll notice that we're also subscribing to that pulled event that we just looked at in the pull measure to update the color of the string itself using a gradient. 
So that pretty much does it for the string render. Let's look at the arrow. All right, now here we are within our arrow script that inherits from the XR Grab Interactable. Now, honestly, there's a lot of different things and moving parts going on within the arrow because it's responsible for actually launching the arrow itself, the direction that it's facing in, and sort of managing all of its physics settings and all that good stuff. So I'm not even going to probably try to explain every little bit of this, but more primarily the sort of section where the arrow is actually launched and sort of the functionality that we need to do while it's flying through the air. And if we scroll down, the first thing that we're going to be taking a look at is this launch function. All of the actual launch functionality is going to come once the arrow has been deselected, specifically by a notch. And this is because once the pull measure has been pulled back enough, it's going to let the notch know, hey, this has been pulled back and it's been released. Let's go ahead and let's deselect the arrow from the notch. And once that happens, this is when all of this functionality is essentially going to happen. And within this launch function, we're going to be calling these three functions, where the first thing is going to be this set launch function where we're passing in a value of true. And this is because we want to let everything on the arrow know, hey, the arrow has been launched, so do whatever you need to do. And then we want to update the quote last position of the arrow to the current tip position. And this is because when we're going to be doing that line raycast that I talked about previously, we want to make sure that we're using a most recent position for the arrow instead of just the initialized value, which would just be vector 3.0. And then for the apply force, we just get the pull measure from the notch we want to get to the actual pull amount and then apply a sort of relative force to the rigid body. And once it's launched within the process interactable function, within every single dynamic update, we want to check for a collision and we want to also update that last position for our tip again. And then within every fixed update, we want to set the direction of the arrow itself. And then scrolling down again, when we're checking for a collision, we're going to be using that line cast. And if we've actually hit something, we want to disable the physics. We want to child the arrow to that object. And then we actually want to see if we hit an actual hittable object where this is actually going to be the code that's going to be checking for that target within our scene. And I'm doing that using this I arrow hittable interface. Now, I think that's a very, very brief overview of the arrow. I would advise taking a little bit of time to sort of look over it yourself and kind of see what it's doing. I imagine you'll most likely have some questions, so feel free to leave them below. Before we start looking at all the target stuff, let's look at the custom interaction manager, where all I've added is a custom force deselect that's going to be used by the notch. And if you remember within our arrow and I said, hey, once the arrow is deselected, we're going to be doing the launch functionality. And we can do that because the notch is going to call this force deselect once we've pulled far back enough on the pull measure. Now, if we quickly look at the target, you'll see that it implements this I arrow hittable interface that gives us this hit function where once this target is hit, we change the material and we're going to apply a force to our little target. And then obviously the interface itself, it's really simple. Okay, now I think that's enough of the explanation. Let's actually write our notch so we can move on with our lives. <laughs> where now that we're in our notch, the first thing you're going to see is that it inherits from the XR socket interactor. And the first thing that we're going to need to add is a float that we're going to call release threshold and give it a range of zero to one. This is going to correspond with that linear value from our start to our endpoint that I mentioned before within the pull measurer. And this just controls how far does the player need to pull back for the actual arrow to be released. We then have a reference to our pull measurer and the Boolean for checking if the notch is actually ready. And if you remember, this is the one that's going to be set by our bow once it's picked up and it's dropped. And then we just have this little helper here where we're going to be getting a reference to the interaction manager and we're going to kind of be casting it as a custom interaction manager whenever we want to access it. And this is so we can easily use that force deselect function. And then within awake, we're obviously going to get our components and we're going to get our pull measurer. And moving on down, we're going to be using a reference to that pull measure to subscribe to some of its events. First thing that we're going to do is whenever the pull measure is released, we're going to release the arrow. And then whenever the pull measure is actually pulled, we actually want to move the attach point for the notch, which again, again, is going to be that middle transform. And then because we're good little programmers, we're going to make sure to unsubscribe from our events and on disable. And once we go to release an arrow, let's just make sure that the target that this notch actually has selected is indeed an arrow. And we've gone beyond the release threshold. And this is where we're going to be calling that force deselect on our custom interaction manager. And we're going to be passing in the keyword this. Because since this is an interactor, we just need to say, hey, does this interactor have an object currently selected? And if it does, let's just force deselect it. 
and then within the move attach function, all we're doing is moving the attached transform of our notch to the current pull position we're getting from the pull measurer. And then we just have the function that's being called by the bow that marks the notch is ready, where we're just going to say, hey, uh, we're passing in a reference to the bow. Is it selected or is it not selected? And then within can select, we're going to be checking a ton of different things to make sure our notch is behaving correctly. We're first going to be calling the base functionality of can select. We're also going to be factoring in can hover because this is going to let us prevent the socket from immediately grabbing the arrow again. Because the socket actually has a bit of a timer for once it sort of deselects an object that we can factor into this. We also want to double check that the arrow that we're trying to select is indeed an arrow and that the notch is actually ready. And then we want to make sure that we're changing the movement type to instantaneous because this will give us a smooth look for when our arrow is following along with our bow. And then the very last thing that we're doing is we want to set this require select exclusive to false. And this lets the socket automatically grab the arrow from the player's hand so the user doesn't have to release the arrow and hopefully the socket grabs it. Once the arrow is close enough, the socket will automatically take it. All right, and I think that's everything. Let's go back into Unity and we're going to test this out. Now that we're back in Unity, let's just go to our notch really quick. And you'll notice that we now have this little slider here for our release threshold. And I don't think we actually need to set any references. So let's hit play and hopefully this works. All right, and everything looks to be working as expected. Thanks for following along on this incredibly long project. If you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll see you all in the next one. But before I go, I'd like to thank all of my wonderful patrons for making this possible. I'd like to specifically thank Sven Ati, David Fufu, Eric Spatrix, Soul Harvesting, Permerswall, Matt Adamson, John Anthony, Todd Andler, Andreas Brillen, Kai Hulin, Garrison Ball, HTKL, Aya Sadar, Bugen, Sean Oliver, David Drexler, Zoe Oliva, Krabby Tiger, Michael Schubert, Peter Chow, Pradeep Nana, Joe Wong, David Bistry, Just Rafiel, Michael Wright, Gleb, and Abudi Taha. Thanks again for all the support. I'll see you all in the next one.